and is now uh, learning Byzantine Greek as well. She was also the primary model uh, and muse for her mother, um, the late Polixeni Papapetru. Um, the topic for her webinar tonight is the art, iconography and historical influence found in the formerly Frankish, then Byzantine stronghold and cultural hub of Mistras, uh, located in the heartland of Laconia. Uh, just a reminder um, that for the duration of the lecture, participants' cameras will be switched off and their audio muted so that Olympia um, isn't accidentally interrupted and to avoid uh, digital lag. Um, and I'll ask again if this uh, isn't the case for anybody, please do so manually. Um, and also, uh, for anyone who might have any questions, please hold them until the end of the webinar um, when you may type them into the Zoom chat found below or on the right of your screen. Uh, where I will read out a few so that Olympia might answer depending on the time. Um, I'd now like to welcome Olympia to begin her lecture. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mithyadi. Um, I'm just unable to share my screen um, yet to open up the presentation. Oh, that's working now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Mithyavi, thank you, Andrew, and the rest of the Palakonian um, Youth Committee for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, it's such an honor to be here tonight. Um, I'm really excited about this series. Um, so I'll be talking about the medieval village of Mistras, um, which is located on a hill west of Sparta um, at the foot of Mount Tayetos. It's an eerie place that Greeks like Hatsidakis refer to as melancholy, but I really want to present a positive view of it. I'm greatly humbled to be inaugurating this series of lectures that hark back to the Battle of Thermopylae, commemorating a landmark of Greek success, um, resistance, uh, self-determination, and obviously Greek spirit. That moment when greatly outnumbered Greeks um, thwarted the ambitions of the Persians is a token of the huge prestige of Hellenic antiquity. To be Greek is to reckon with a massive patrimony that predates the Christian epoch, and that simultaneous admiration and denial of the preeminence of a pagan past is a huge part of my story tonight in Mistras. Um, so could we ever have, or could we ever have had a Renaissance where the truly ancient past was honored as identity forming? Um, could Greeks of the Orthodox tradition ever have reclaimed the deeper Hellenism of the pagan world? So just to set the scene, um, I'll begin by talking about the naming of the city. Um, I'll then give a chronological outline of the city from about 1204, um, where our journey starts to the present day. I'll then talk about a long poem, um, The Chronicle of the Morea, a key source uh, for the history of the Frankish states established in Greece after the conquest of Constantinople in 1204. I'll then go over one of the main thinkers of this time, um, Yemistus Pletho, and the ways in which he is influential in forming the Renaissance. If I find uh, evidence of a Renaissance in these two phenomena, the question remains, is there any material evidence of a Greek Renaissance in the period? So I'll discuss some of the main churches and chapels, as well as the frescoes inside, and I'll check out their stylistic innovations. Um, as Miltiadi mentioned, there'll also be some time for questions afterwards. I wanted to start with this quote, uh, which is the charming opening lines uh, for the Chronicle of the Morea I'll be talking about shortly, um, because this is a story. So in Greek, it reads, Thelo nase afigitho afigisin megalin, kian thelis name akroastis ol piso nasaresi. Um, I want to tell you a great tale, and if you'll listen to me, I hope it will please you. The intrigue begins with the very name, um, the name of the town and the name of the region that it seemed to command. So which terms should historians use to talk about this region and this town? Are we to use the name Mistras rather than Mitsitra, which seems to be the earliest form, at least it's what we see in the chronicle. Modern Greek speakers um, may know that Mitsitra is a type of cheese. Um, there must be some connection, but probably the place explains uh, the, the cheese rather than the cheese explaining the place. Um, in the same way that Brie is a place in uh, France before it was a cheese and uh, Champagne is a region before it was a wine. So um, William II, uh, he was King of England uh, from 1087 until 1100, um, was recorded to have found a remarkable hill, a fragment of a mountain 
And there in 1249, he built a fortress and called it Mitsitras because they shattered it thus. And he made it into a glorious castle and a great chateau fort. This is from the Chronicle of Morea. Um, and the Greek for this is ke mitsitranto nomasen diatito ekrasan urtos. Or do we call it mistras, which represents um, probably the most correct transliteration from the modern Greek. This is also probably the form that seems uh, most acceptable to the traveler of today. Similarly, do we consider the Peloponnese and the Morea to be interchangeable? with uh, Morea being the name that was current in Frankish and Venetian times, but usually avoided by the official Greek world. So the Franks popularized the name Morea for the peninsula. Um, its etymology is disputed, but it probably derived from the mulberry tree. Um, again, uh, modern Greek, we've got the word Muria, um, whose leaves are similar in shape to the peninsula. Mistra was the soul and center of uh, the medieval Peloponnese. It was a large town and the security of its hillside site was um, strengthened by sets of fortifications. Um, this would encourage the building of palaces, of aristocratic mansions, monasteries and other churches. It is situated on a steep hill uh, on the north slopes of Mount Tayetos, about six kilometers from Sparta. Today, it's somewhat of a ghost city with its uh, castle, churches and the palatial complex in ruins but it's a place that's uh, long been studied, admired, um, even idealized. I've put here an engraving uh, of Mistras in the 17th century, which I think is a good example to show how it's been idealized and romanticized. It looks as though it could be um, in a book of fairy tales almost. It was in Mistra that Goethe placed in the second part of his Faust, the meeting of Faust with Helen of Troy. Goethe never visited Greece and his knowledge of Greek topography was perhaps a bit shaky, but his sense of symbolism was sure. Um, so I've put some very nice lines here by Goethe, which I feel are significant. Um, he feels that there could be no better site uh, for the meeting of the classical and the medieval world than this city. So our journey begins in 1204, where the Latin, um, the Western participants of the Fourth Crusade capture Constantinople. Um, they would found the Latin Empire of Romania. Before then, uh, very little is known of Mistras. Um, inscriptions and fragments of ancient marbles have been found built into the walls, but research has not yet been able to reveal any trace of pre-classical or classical habitation. In 1249, the fourth Frankish prince of the Morea, Guillaume II de Villardouin, encounters Mistras and he decides to build a castle on the summit. In the Chronicle of the Morea, uh, the following passage is found. After searching through these parts, he found a strange hill, as though cut off from the mountain, about five kilometers away above Lacedaemonia. And the Greek for this I've put um, just next to it. Kioson kala tameri ekinaola. Ivren vuni paraxenon, apokoma is oros, apanotis lacadaimonias canena milin pleon. Some 10 years later, in 1259, um, the Battle of Pelagonia takes place. Um, Byzantines defeat the Franks, and William II is taken prisoner. Um, he's set free in 1262 after ceding three grand uh, castles to the Byzantine emperor as ransom. It's after this point uh, that the town gradually takes shape. And at the end of the 14th century, um, Mistras becomes the center of the Peloponnese and it flourishes as never before. It becomes an intellectual center where artists and writers uh, found a refuge. At its height, um, it was a bustling town of uh, some 20,000 souls. In 1460, um, Mistras falls into Turkish hands. It lost its grand status, but remained a commercial center where at one stage 42,000 people lived. For a short time as well, Mistras was under the control of the Venetians. Um, this was from 1687 to about 7, uh, 1715, um, but was again taken over by the Turks until it was one of the first castles of Greece to be liberated in 1821. It's only much later, um, so in the 19th century, that Mistras becomes the administrative, um, military, urban and ecclesiastical center of the Peloponnese. After two fires uh, and the founding of modern Sparta, the town's life would end. Um, so in 1989, it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Monument. Today, it still exists. Um, the Palace of Mistras and some churches are under the restoration process. 
uh, in the courtyard of Agios Dimitrios, which we'll come to a bit later on, you can uh, visit the archaeological museum with many Byzantine and ecclesiastical exhibits. So I'd like uh, to turn to now the Chronicle of the Morea, which is a massive poem of about 9,000 lines. It's a Greek variation of a metric chronicle written in French, Italian, and Aragonese. It details the events of the Franks' establishment of feudalism in mainland Greece, and it's a key source uh, for the history of the Frankish states established in Greece after the conquest of Constantinople in 1204. It gives insight to the feudal culture of Greece under the French, um, so the Franchi, the practice of chivalry, uh, the conduct of warfare, uh, how the Frankish colonists had adapted themselves to the lives of their subjects. But perhaps more importantly, the text details the exploits of the French crusaders who took over the bright and beautiful lands of the peninsula. So, Ijora y la Broteri son campon tu Moreos and built the castle Echtisan atop Mistras, which is described both as a spangling castle, Labron Castron, and a great fort in the same line, Kemera um, Dinamarin. It has been suggested that the poem was originally written by a French person, then translated into Greek, but the fact that it's cast in rhythmical verse uh, in a vernacular Greek suggests at least to me that the Greek version is primary. Although all colonization is distasteful, the chivalrous tone of the chronicle is not pure fantasy. Um, the French depend on cooperation with the local Greeks, which was conducive to cultural miscegenation and hybridity. And even their adherence to ethical warfare, although obviously questionable in our time, uh, could be contrasted with the genocidal practices of the Turks. Um, as Adolf Struck describes uh, in his book on Mistras, when the Ottomans came in 1770, um, the defenseless priests chanted the liturgy to no effect. The Turks mercilessly slit their bodies open and distributed them to the dogs so that some were unlucky enough to see with their own eyes the beasts gnawing their still pulsating intestines. Got the reference for this just here. Um, on this scale of atrocities, the feudalism of the French would have been relatively benign um, and was favorable to the inspiration of a renaissance of sorts where faith would be infused with hybrid influences. Um, and this leads me to my next point. There are a lot of reasons uh, to take an interest in this place, um, partly because it's spectacular and part, but also partly because it's a significant theater of uh, cultural interchange between Greeks and the West. What we're looking at here is a hybrid culture, and this is where the term um, gasmuli or gasmul comes up. This is a population uh, mainly of Greeks, but also Slavs, Albanians, and Jews. But in this time, the invaders um, had come without their wives. Only the wealthiest could afford to bring their wives from the West. The poorer kings, uh, the poorer knights, sorry, had found Greek wives, and this led to the emergence of a new uh, mixed ethnicity known as the gasmul. Um, so in Greek, the word for this is chasmuli. The term itself is of unknown etymology and it first appeared in the second half of the 13th um, century. It is, however, not unlikely that it has some relation with the Latin word mulus, uh, mule. The term was generally used to refer to children uh, of those uh, mixed unions. It more specifically uh, designated the children of a Byzantine woman and a Latin, often Venetian father. So in the Morea, the children of knights uh, tended to identify more with the father's kin. They spoke French, uh, they adhered to the Latin church, whereas the children of poorer soldiers were more apt to speak Greek and to follow their mother's religion. But most of them uh, would inherit their father's taste for fighting. The Western clergy who came in with the conquerors were determined to Latinize the whole church. Um, the Orthodox Greek bishops were driven into exile and in their cathedrals, there were services with a strange ritual in an alien tongue. But the Franks were not without influence on Greek life. Um, all the Greek despots in league with the French married Frankish princesses and these connections explain certain characteristics of the art of Mistras, which we'll come to soon. In addition to its role in the political world of medieval Greece, um, Mistras was a center of late Byzantine cultural and artistic flowering that influenced the Italian Renaissance and engendered 
significant theoretical and spiritual elements in the revival of classical antiquity. Mistras's cultural preeminence stemmed from Yorgos Yemistras Plepon, who lived there most of the period between about 1407 to 1452. He was the city's most famous resident, um, a free thinking scholar. He taught in Mistras uh, from about 1410 until 1452, where he really championed platonic thought, um, finding a very sympathetic response in the West. His neoplatonic project of influencing an embattled and dogmatic Greek was doomed, um, remembering as well that the Platonic Academy in Constantinople had been abolished for centuries during the Komnenos dynasty. But his 15th century voyage to Florence uh, successfully introduced the works of Plato to the West. Yemistros greatly enjoyed the intellectual atmosphere um, of the court of despots in Mistras, where his words were resonant. So he says, um, we are Hellenes by race and culture. And this is key to his doctrine. He claimed that the destruction of Byzantium lay in the fact that it renounced the former Greek tradition and was steeped in the Roman tradition. He wanted to resurrect the former positive meaning of the word Hellene, which he felt had become a synonym of pagan and was therefore pejorative. So since the days of Constantine the Great, the word Hellene had lost its true meaning. Um, it had been used to denote an idol worshiper as opposed to Christian. Greeks might talk to each other in Greek, but they felt themselves to be heirs of the Roman empire through Constantine. And so Plato's presence would attract many scholars to Mistras. Um, he was hailed as the second Plato and he was directly influential in bringing the revived Hellenic culture of Byzantium to the West. Now, can we see any tincture in these qualities in the visual arts? Do they reflect either the Westernization in the Chronicle or something like the liberal humanism of Plato? So, um, I'll come now to talk about uh, the churches of Mistras and their frescoes. The chief glory of the city is its churches. Um, in addition to numerous monasteries and large churches, there are also a number of uh, smaller churches in um, Demotic, we call these uh, ecclesakia, small uh, like chapels. Few of Mistras churches survive to this day, um, but most of those that have perished were small chapels which would uh, serve a family. Although many buildings uh, seem to have Western influence, uh, religious architecture remained true to the Byzantine tradition. Wall paintings are also, um, they're an inseparable part of Orthodox culture um, and churches. And they're also a luxury enjoyed by the powerful um, in their private homes. They, um, the frescoes that we'll see um, embody a wide range of styles and sensibilities. Um, they're truly noteworthy for their varied technique and um, differing artistic trends. Um, most of the great Mistra frescoes are built around the cycles of Christ's life and miracles, um, the life of the Virgin and stories um, from the lives of saints. Um, remembering also that icons to the Byzantines were more than mere paintings. The first church I'd like to talk about is the Panthanasa, um, meaning queen of all. Uh, it's one of the traditional epithets of the Virgin Mary in Greek Orthodoxy. This is perhaps the best preserved of all the monuments in Mistras. Um, the exterior shows a general acceptance of Western decorative elements um, on a Byzantine structure. The interior adheres to an Orthodox tradition. It's a brilliant example of the architecture of Mistras at the beginning of the 15th century. Um, and it's also the, mon the only monastery in Mistras that uh, continues to be active today. Um, in the mid 19th century, it was converted into a convent, uh, which is how it remains today. Um, the style of iconography that we'll be seeing shortly is quite similar to uh, the iconography that we'll be seeing in the Periplatos, um, which is the next church I'll look at. But um, the school of artists who painted the Pantanasa was eclectic. Um, the paintings are of high quality and they can be dated with reasonable certainty to about 1430. The frescoes of the Pantanasa are colorful and intense. Um, these paintings give volume to faces, um, to rocky landscapes. Uh, the colors used are nicely contrasting with complementaries, and the shadows are shown in deeper tones, um, often of the same colors. 
The modeling of the body is often soft uh, with many shadows and uh, nice delicate white highlights. I wanted to read out a quote by uh, Stephen Runciman. So he says, the artists were still highly accomplished, but the drawing is hampered by a desire to fit too much, or sorry, too many figures into the space. Somehow the religious intensity of early Byzantine work is gone. It is almost as if we're looking at the uh, illustrations to a book of fairy stories. One feels that the artists were trying to transfer a style suited to book illumination to larger spaces for which it was unsuitable. There is great charm about it all, but it is the art of a civilization that has outlived its political basis, an art of wistful nostalgia for which there was no future. The paintings in the Pantana Sant Mistra formed the last important monument of the medieval free Greek world. Runciman belongs to the Greece in its decrepitude theory of Mistras. Whereas I would argue that actually what we're seeing is Byzantium coming alive with an animation that we could also see in Italy. We get a glimpse of what we would have seen uh, if the Renaissance was left to the Greeks instead of seized from them. So it's precisely this um, that I'm looking for. I'm going to be looking at these churches and these frescoes in the hope that we get evidence whether there's a credible Renaissance taking place before the invasion or whether it's this more reductive view of old Byzantium is dying. So here, what we're looking at is um, the apse of um, this church. Uh, we're seeing the Virgin and Child enthroned. There's a great energetic spilling of figures. Um, it's beautifully chromatic and it's contrasted uh, here with this uh, harsh structure of the pediment, which I'll get to soon. Um, there are two figures on either side of Mary um, and even below Mary herself, there's this green parapet that they're on. Um, they're on top of it, it's just here, um, which could be interpreted as the floor. But it's quite radical to have the band. Um, it shows that there's a lot of spilling into space and this spilling movement is also true of the barrel vault that we're looking at as well. Um, there's a lot of dynamic interchange of figures in motion. So I wanted to suggest how this contrasts with the rigid classical pediment that looks like uh, 19th century neoclassicism. Uh, the text reads, Esi vikis ophthalmos ostapanthora. So it's the eye of justice who sees everything. What we're seeing here is a nativity scene, um, which is an ambitious piece of uh, continuous narrative showing sections of the life of Christ. Um, so in the, uh, so we've got the nativity here in the center. Um, we've got uh, probably midwives here washing him. Um, then just below, we've got Christ the Good Shepherd. Uh, to the left, we've got uh, flight into Egypt. There's a real, um, a very striking use of green here, um, symbolizing nature, um, but there's also a lot of complementary red. The artist has made uh, an interesting choice to place the Virgin on a bed of red, perhaps as a way of separating her from making direct contact with the earth. Um, she's too precious to lie on the rock itself. Um, so she needs a cloth to protect her. Um, so here um, we're looking at uh, the entry into Jerusalem. It's a detail, um, which uh, is a scene, it's, um, a scene that takes place uh, days before the Last Supper. Um, it marks the beginning of um, his passion. Um, so in John, crowds gather, uh, gather around Jesus and believe in him after he raises Lazarus, uh, Lazarus from the dead. And the next day, uh, the multitudes that had gathered for, uh, for the feast in Jerusalem welcome him as he enters the city. We're seeing here a great um, multiplicity of form. There's also great uh, polychromatic variety. Um, the faces here are not really discernible. This could be, um, well, it could be due to the fact that it's pla uh, painted into plaster, um, but it's probably more likely that it's due to acts of vandalism and barbarism. Um, but again, it's hard to know what we, can tell uh, looking at that is that the uh, detail of the walled city is almost too clear in comparison. Um, so I've got another detail here um, of this work. And you can really see here the, if it is, um, the perhaps hacking of the faces that makes them very hard to discern. 
I wanted to show um, Ducho's um, entry to Jerusalem in comparison and this is part of the Maya star. Um, Ducho's is quite clumpy. Um, people are almost piled on top of each other. It's more, perhaps even more linear. Um, whereas Mistras is more evenly spread out. It has an almost freeze-like develop development. Um, and the respect for the picture plane is stronger. Look at how the architecture is used for its nooks and crannies. Um, it's highly animated, it's dramatic. We've got people who are peeping out of windows um, and uh, perhaps verandas or balconies. Um, there are strong efforts here to create energy and animation. Um, we're also seeing effort uh, to make things three-dimensional as well. So just here, for example. But both works um, share a great sense of episode. They're both incredibly vibrant. Um, they both share spatial ambiguities and perhaps neither has completely resolved the drawing. I wanted to move uh, now to talk about the Periblatos, um, which is perhaps the finest uh, of all the Mistra churches. It's perhaps also the most significant iconographically and it definitely sets the example for iconography in other churches that we'll see. There are no documentary sources for the history of the monastery. Um, the information of the church is scant, um, but it has an intimate um, private quality and perhaps but for its lavish frescoes uh, is decorated only with a few simple columns and a grey and white marble floor. Um, it's likely to have been uh, founded by the first despot of Misra and even his wife um, and it's likely that she uh, herself played an active role in the design of the monastic complex. Um, the painted decoration inside follows the um, traditional, um, or follows uh, Orthodox tradition um, faithfully and unconditionally, which I'll show here. Um, it has been suggested that um, the iconographic arrangement of scenes doesn't present the clarity and simplicity that uh, we might see in other um, churches or monasteries, um, such as Ayos Dimitrios, which we'll come to. But nonetheless, uh, there is a sense of drama and it definitely has uh, originality in its frescoes. Um, art historian Annie Labbott said, um, space and movement are treated with a Western feel in these frescoes. Um, several of the most important frescoes, so the Ascension, um, Dormition of the Virgin, the Nativity and the Last Supper, among others, were apparently painted by a single um, brilliant though unknown artist. So here um, we've got another nativity scene, um, although it's quite different to the last one that we've just seen. Um, got uh, great contrasts between complementary oranges and blues. Um, from the left, upper left, uh, we've got gentle idealized figures with richly dressed hair. Um, these are the apostles who are arriving on clouds. Also got a flight into Egypt on the left, um, donkey in the manger, but the figures are weightless. Um, they have this light and airy quality. The modeling around them is soft and round. They stand almost insecurely or tentatively on small delicate feet. They seem not so much to move as to float. Um, they're weightless as if they're almost too fragile to have ever walked the earth. Um, they're more spirit than flesh. The general tone of this work is quite dark. Um, the background is darker yet, um, but the heaviness and the real gravitas in the image culminates in the Virgin. She pulls the image down and she gives it great weight. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the rock um, seems to surge upwards with a ferocious kind of energy. This is very florid. Um, we're seeing rock forms that are minimal and jagged, but they flow and they seem to sprout. Their crystalline forms become almost like leaves, um, just here at the top, which could be a metaphor of growth. Um, seeing also the world splitting open, engulfing the Virgin, which becomes, the space becomes almost her bower, breaks up into shards like an allegory of the collapse of life um, that is also the origin of growth and rebirth. I wanted to briefly compare it to the Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi in Rome. Um, 
this is uh, Bernini. Um, the story behind this uh, was that he had asked um, the apprentices to handle the figures, um, but he didn't believe that they'd be able to hand the rock. So he personally chiseled the rock. Um, so I'm not comparing it with a 17th century example to make the case that the master of Mistras is three centuries ahead of his time, um, but the artist clearly attempts the challenge with gusto. The question is, how do you fit the chaos of nature into a compelling composition? Well, you have to use imagination. Um, and this use of fantasy even is a sign of the Renaissance. Um, it's the idea of making the rock work pictorially. So um, now we're looking at uh, the baptism of Christ um, by John the Baptist. This is a major event in the life of Christ um, described in three of the gospels. We're seeing a humble, almost timid Christ who takes up little space with his crossed legs. We're seeing also a great contrast of yellows and blues uh, of lights and dark. He's standing in somewhat of a liminal space in between two worlds, um, perhaps water and land, uh, earthly and the spiritual, faithful and the damned. To me, this is quite an original baptism. Um, Christ is standing among fish and humans who are falling in. Either they are taking their baptism uh, or through his baptism, they're being cast into hell. But my point with this is that the artist is making the rules. Um, he's doing theology just as they would in Italy. Um, the frescoes in this church have excellent workmanship. Um, there's a touch of humanity, uh, human drama, pathos. Um, there's a strong sense of movement. The colors are rich, but not too lavish. It's said that the artists may have come from Constantinople for the purpose, uh, or they may have belonged, uh, belonged to a local school. There are sadly no surviving frescoes from the period in Constantinople uh, that can guide us, which is why I would probably suggest that these frescoes might be of a native school. Um, they do have an individuality of their own. So I'll move now to talk about Ayos Dimitrios. This is the earliest of the surviving churches of Misras, um, built in the second half of the 13th century. The exterior of the church incorporates all the many features or hallmarks of uh, Byzantine architecture. So we're seeing arches piled on top of each other, interlacing brickwork, um, red tile roofs that look almost like uh, caps. The metropolis is one of the many Mistra churches adorned with brilliant frescoes um, spanning several centuries and many styles as well. They may be perhaps a bit more modest by comparison to what we've just seen um, in the Perivletos, but they do follow a kind of stylistic trend in which the human form is represented with three dimensionality, but without exaggeration. Um, this is a trend visible in some of the most outstanding monuments uh, of Constantinople, um, mostly from the decade uh, of 1310 to 1320. Uh, it is also here uh, where Const uh, Constantinos Paleologos, the last Byzantine empire was crowned in 1449. This is a scene of the presentation of the Virgin Mary in the temple, um, also known as the entry uh, of the most holy Theotokos into the temple. We're seeing here uh, Joachim and Anna bringing the Virgin to the three priests. Notice how she is too precious to be touched with bare hands. Um, Joachim carries her through the cloth uh, that forms part of his garb, creating a barrier between the sacred and the worldly. What really struck me about this fresco in particular is this red cloth um, that's uh, hang it's um, hanging between two points, um, a column here and the edicule. This cloth or this style of cloth uh, appears in Byzantine painting. Uh, it's a link between buildings. Um, but we might wonder why has the artist made a choice to include a cloth? Um, has, has he done this so that he's filling an empty space, um, the horror vacui, um, in which instance it may have been 
at it afterwards? Or has he done it for more a more symbolic purpose? Um, perhaps it works to, um, it's, it's being draped over the Holy of Holies um, to dignify them. Here um, we're looking at Saint Demetrios preaching in prison. Um, so Saint Demetrios spent most of his life um, as a devout missionary. Um, he was um, said to have been preaching the gospel at secret meetings and converting pagans to the Christian faith. He was denounced as a Christian and thrown into prison. This work is, um, I'd say, fairly two-toned uh, chromatic wessing, um, hot and cold colours um, that are also working to mark out space. Again, what struck me about this is that Saint Demetrius is supposedly in prison, but he's in full regalia enthroned. I think this is a sign that the figure is to be understood symbolically, um, no matter how abject the circumstances, this great saint in essence is an enthroned being. The last fresco that I wanted to show is um, one of the miracles of Christ where um, he puts forth his hand and he touches and heals the worshipping lepers. Um, I think, again, what struck me about this is the um, Renaissance feel that it has. Um, the huddling figures um, on the left is quite Renaissance in style with lots of overlap. Um, we're also seeing a conversation rather than um, bodies um, being almost rhythmic or um, stagnant. So one figure here has um, diverted his attention from what Christ is doing um, to speak to Peter or whoever it is behind him. I think this is a nice human touch um, that his attention is elsewhere. What Christ is doing is obviously very important, but there's also a conversation here um, that's important as well. I think um, this is a great example of how we're headed toward the Renaissance. Um, it's clearly all Byzantine, but I do feel here that it's clearly headed towards the Renaissance. So um, the curiosity and invention in visual style that we've seen in these frescoes really um, support the idea that Greece was poised for a Renaissance. This was a culture that was ripe for free thought, um, inventive humanism, even in enigmas and symbols. One could only imagine an alternative timeline where the Turks did not intercede. But we're seeing the kind of self-determination that Italy greatly enjoyed. The painters experimented with the rendering of landscape and space and gave dramatic roles to color and light, revealing a fondness for invention, um, somewhat analogous to innovations also found in the West. This Renaissance spirit and innovative questioning indicate the potential of an art form whose development was abruptly halted by the Ottoman conquest. Even if there was sympathy for it in specialist enclaves, within orthodoxy, um, Turkish occupation sapped the cultural life that had made Mistra famous. There was no room uh, in the Islamic domain for a neo-pagan like Plethon, um, and so the Greek Renaissance was aborted. So could we ever have, or could we ever have had a Renaissance where the truly ancient past was honored as identity forming? Could Greeks of the Orthodox tradition ever have reclaimed the deeper Hellenism of the pagan world? I guess ultimately we'll never know, um, but the remains of Mistras suggests that um, the Greeks could have been Hellenes again, as well as the Romioi of old. So this uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you uh, so much once again to Miltiadi and Andrew and uh, the rest of the Palaconian Youth Brotherhood for having me tonight. Um, I did uh, also, um, I've attached a bibliography if anyone wants to take a screenshot, um, but I will end it here and hand it over to Miltiadi um, to fill any questions. Um, thank you so much, um, Olympia, for that amazing, 
um, and really engaging lecture um, with such a, a breadth of research and interpretation. And Thank you so much for having me. We'll, we'll all be following your achievements in life uh, with great Thank pride. It's always Thank you so good much. to see another Greek succeed. Um, so thank you for preparing this work and um, yeah, thank you again for taking part in our commemorative lecture series. Um, I'd like to now remind everybody that um, this is the first in a series. Um, and if anybody would like to join us, we have our second lecture tomorrow night, um, 21st of August at 6 p.m. Um, and other lectures on the 25th of August and on the 10th of September. Um, now onto the questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, please type them into the chat and I'll ask Olympia. Um, let me just have a look if anybody. Okay, there's a question. Is Mistras the only hotspot for a potential Western or humanist inspired Renaissance? And that's from Andrew. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think there. Um, there definitely was quite a distinct renaissance um, in Crete. Um, it spanned um, maybe from 1500 to 1670. Um, I, I strongly feel that Venetian held Crete um, in the 16th century breathes the atmosphere um, of the renaissance. We see um, Cretan artists developing a particular style of painting influenced um, both by tradition in the East and the West. Um, a great example of this is uh, El Greco who came from Crete. It's, um, it's perhaps a rather abrupt affair um, transitioning from medieval to Renaissance styles, um, but it's definitely there. Um, and I, I believe uh, the church in uh, St. Francis in Rethymno is a really good example of this. Mm. Uh, that's a great question. That's, a, that's a, a really amazing answer as well. So thank you so much for answering. Oh, there's another question, um, this time from Nikos. Hello, Olympia. Well done on your fantastic presentation. I had a question for you. You mentioned the Chronicle of Morea. Are there any other important vernacular poems that suggest a possible Greek Renaissance? That's, uh, thank you, Nico. That's a great question as well. Um, I think uh, a good example of this um, could be the uh, Eroticos written again uh, by a Cretan poet, um, that's by Cornaros. Um, so he, um, I think that could be a good example. There's also um, uh, the romantic epic poem, uh, Erotokritos. Um, I think that was in a, a kind of a vernacular Cretan dialect. Um, that could be another good example um, of a text. Um, that's amazing. I know that from our private conversations, um, the Chronicle of Morea is a very difficult and dense text. So um, again, thank you for trawling through it and um, picking <laughs> some gems. It, it um, definitely, it, it's definitely a, a written in a tricky Greek um, that I'm not used to, but um, yes, it's incredible to read. Um, another question here from Robert. Um, there's a lot of undraped flesh in these frescoes. Um, is this atypical of Byzantine frescoes? And I'm not too sure if that's uh, got or meant to be Scott, but. Um... Um, I, that's, yeah, that's a really interesting question as well. Um, uh, there, is, there is definitely a lot of undraped flesh. Um, I think uh, they definitely weren't afraid of, um, of skin and uh, it could even um, point to the naturalism that was so, um, uh, I guess, uh, used in Renaissance. Um, I'm not too sure if it's atypical of Byzantine frescoes, but um, what we do see in these frescoes is, um, I, at least I feel very original, um, but it's a, it's a good question that I'll, I'd like to look more into. Mm. Um. Well, here's a question from me. Um, uh, in regards to the conservation, did you manage to do any further research on that? Because I remember the last time I went to Mistra, um, unfortunately, a lot of it was shut. Um, mm -hmm. So um, hopefully the next time I go, it's been reopened. Um, but did you manage to come across anything about that in your readings? Um, so what I do know is that they were, um, I think, working on uh, Ayos Dimitrios, 
um, as well as um, a couple of the other smaller chapels. Um, I'm not sure how much work uh, they've done and how much um, they've been able to kind of um, restore, but I know that they are definitely working on it at the moment. Um, probably at the moment, it's all been um, put to a bit of a halt um, due to obvious circumstances, but um, I, I do know that recently they have been working on it. Hmm. Um, another question here from Angela. Um, with reference to the link to the Renaissance, um, was not the link to Florence coming from Constantinople when it was sacked? And the Florentines adopting the Greek styles from Constantinople uh, rather than the Peloponnese. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's always a lot of um, interchange and link uh, between both places. Um, I think it's very easy for us to say that um, that Italy, um, or at least in my um, in my education, um, I was always, um, I guess, taught that it's Italy that influences Greece. Uh, and if anything, um, looking at Mistras has taught me that it's um, perhaps uh, Greece that has influenced many aspects of the Italian Renaissance. Um, with figures like um, Pletho, we can really see that he, I mean, he, uh, Florentines were absolutely charmed by him. Um, he went there and they, um, they, had great admiration, great respect for him. Um, and so I guess, yeah, we are seeing um, both, if this, I hope this answers your question, but we're seeing both um, uh, Greeks um, in Italy and Italians in Greece. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think that um, um, you've answered that very well. I mean, if, if there was a Constantinopolitan influence in Italy, then um, you know, you've, you've clearly evidenced the Peloponnesian sort of Laconian influence as well. Um, any more questions? Um, there are some questions from Facebook, if you are able. Um, let's have a look. Um, when the Ottoman Empire invaded Mistras, did most people leave um, or were they killed, forced to adapt with the new leaders of their land? This is from Paris, um, Stavrianakos. Um, so was the question, sorry, um, were many people killed? Um, did many people leave or were they sort of forced to adapt um, to the Ottomans? Um, yeah, so a bit of both. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people were unable to leave. Um, and I had uh, a quote at the start, um, uh, which I can um, bring up again, but it was um, talking about the um, savagery that took place um, in Mistra. Um, uh, a lot of the time as well, um, so this was the, um, uh, this was the quote I read out um, about, um, I'll just find it. Um, uh, so uh, priests were um, practicing, um, they were chanting and uh, upon when, when they were doing that, um, the Turks came in and slit their bodies. It's really uh, a very graphic text and it's horrible to think about but it lends itself to the idea that this was, um, these were acts of savagery. And so obviously um, religion was unable to be practiced in that way. Um, I think that covers all the, all the questions so far. Um, so um, without further ado, um, again, I'd like to reiterate my Great thanks to you, Olympia, personally, for taking the time um, to uh, research, um, prepare and present um, for all of us tonight. And I know that we'll be collaborating again very soon in the future. Um, so um, I'd like to bring this Zoom uh, to an end. And thank you to our uh, listeners, both on Facebook Live and, and here. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, if you've missed it, uh, please make sure to tell everybody that um, it's on Facebook Live and published. Thank you so much, Mithyavi. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks everyone else um, from Peloconian Youth.